Hello, welcome. In this video, we're going to look at function operations. So we're going to add them and subtract them. We're going to multiply and divide them. And we'll look at it from an algebraic perspective first. Then we'll look at it from a graphical perspective. And then we'll look at it from an application perspective. Maybe to try and answer that so what question. Like, how does this all fit into the world? So what's going on here? Well, you can add functions. You can multiply them and divide them. And we have notation for it as well. So if you want to add two functions, let's say f and g, or subtract them, you could write it this way. It's totally fine. Or you can write it like this, f plus if it's adding, or minus the other function, in this case g, of x. And you specify what the input would be. So those mean the same thing. And if you want to multiply, you would write it like this, f, g. I would highly suggest avoiding the dot in this notation. That'll confuse you with compositions of functions, which you'll see shortly. So f times g of x. And then with division, it's f over g of x. So these are just some common notations. And what this means is you can literally add functions, multiply them, or divide them. And there are some domain restrictions, which we'll get into in our reading in the chapter and further class discussion. But it's suffice to say that whatever your domain is of f, whatever your domain is of g, when you add them together, when the same when you multiply them, you're looking at the intersection of the domain restrictions. So whatever restrictions apply for f and g, whatever apply for both of them, are going to result here in their sum or difference or product. And the same is true for division, except when you're dividing, you, can't, you can also not divide by 0. So you'd have to also put in a restriction that the function you're dividing by can't equal 0. So that's just the general definition. Algebraically, let's make up some functions. Let's say f of x is, let me get a simple linear function, 3x plus 2, and g of x is, I don't know, let's make it some quadratic function, x squared plus 4. So if I said find f of x plus g of x, you would just add these equations to each other. That would be it. It would be, all right, in this order, x squared plus 3x plus 4 plus 2, so plus 6. If you were subtracting them, f of x minus g of x, that would just equal here 3x plus 2 minus the sum of x squared and 4, which would be negative x squared plus 3x and then 2 minus 4, negative 2. Man, I'll just show two more. f of x times g of x, you would multiply these functions. So you distribute the first binomial times uh, by the second. So you get 3x times x squared, which would be 3x cubed. 3x times 4 would be 12x. 2 times x squared would be 2x squared. And 2 times 4 would be 8. Simplify if you can. 3x squared plus 2x squared, I'll go in descending order, 3x cubed plus 2x squared plus 12x plus 8. And then with the division, let's see what that looks like. f of x divided by g of x, that would get you 3x plus 2 over x squared plus 4, but x squared plus 4 cannot equal 0. Now, it's interesting, my, my choice here. There is no real value of x squared. That would be negative 4 plus 4 that equals 0. So here, the domain could be any value, right? The only restriction would be if you were allowed complex numbers. Remember, when we discuss domain and range here, we are assuming that the domain is including real numbers and the range is including real numbers, unless specified otherwise. So even though x squared plus 4 can't equal 0, which I'll make a note of in my in my equation over here, there is no real number I can plug in to get a zero below. It's not possible. So there's no domain restriction. So that's the algebraic process. That's the thinking. Graphically, what does this look like? All right, well, here's a fun situation. In this situation right here, we've got a linear function, f of x equals 1 half x plus 2. Remember what that means, right? We start at 2. Our slope is a half, so we go up 1 over 2, up 1 over 2. This is our linear function. And then we have another linear function, g of x. I made them parallel. So g of x is 1 half x plus 3. So 
f of x has an intercept of 2, g of x has an intercept of 3. Let me take a moment and think about what would it look like or what would it even mean to try to add f of x plus g of x. If you're watching this video, pause it and, uh, well I guess you are watching this video, pause it and try to imagine what it will look like and then press play and we'll, we'll look at that together. Okay, so what does it mean to add two functions? Well, it means specifically that you are adding the outputs. You add the outputs. That's what you're really doing here. So for example, at 0, this point on f of x is 0, 2. This point on g of x is 0, 3. So the first point on our new function, let's call it h of x, is going to equal 2 plus 3, and it's going to start at 5. But then let's jump up here. If I have an input of 2 in the first function, it's the point 2, 3, and then here it's 2, 4. Well, now the output is going to be 3 plus 4, and that's at 7. So the new function h at an input of 2 goes to a height of 7 here. And let's do one more, and you'll see what's happening. We'll plug in 4 next. So in the first function, f of 4 is a half of 4 plus 2, so it's 2 plus 2, it's 4. And then g of 4 is a half of 4 plus 3, so that's 2 plus 3 is 5. So 5 plus 4 is 9. So now it's going to be 9. That is the wrong input. So you can see it's forming a new line with a new slope. It's a steeper slope. It's not a parallel result, right? The function h has a steeper incline. Why does that make sense? Why does that make sense? Can you pause the video and think about it? Press play when you're ready to, to talk about it. Okay, so it's true that both f and g are climbing at the same rate. But as you go along, you're, each time, what are you doing? You're adding the output of f, this height right here, to the output of g, this height up here. So each time you go up here, what are you doing? You're not adding the same amount, right? You're adding more because the height of f is increasing each time. It's more than it was before. And so is the height of g. Of course, they're increasing at the same rate, so the result is a straight line. right? But this line is going to be steeper because it's including both of the outputs of f and g. So it's, in, it's climbing, essentially, at a faster rate. You might think for a moment, how would I get it so that the new line is parallel to the others? Think about that, and let's see if we can get it to work on Desmos. Okay, so I think if you have a flat line that it will work. Let's see. There it goes. And interestingly enough, if you set it equal to a slider, you can see that it moves the output up and down. Right here, negatives goes below and above. And you can see graphically that you're just adding the same output, f, whatever f is, to g, so you get a new line that has the same slope. All right, so I hope you enjoyed that. Let's go here. All right, let's go back. So what, right? Why, why do we have all these operations? Well, let's imagine we have a company, and it's called, it's a popcorn company called What's Poppin'? What's Poppin'? This is our company. They're selling popcorn, right? Maybe they have a question mark and an exclamation point because they actually want to know what's happening, and they're also excited about popcorn. Now, this company, imagine that it wants to think about its profit. So profit is what you're making after expenses are taken from revenue. Revenue, all the money you earn, in this case, from selling your popcorn, minus the cost of making that popcorn, all the ingredients and wages, all interesting things. We're going to simplify this process significantly, but we're going to do it in such a way that you can understand why these function operations are so intuitive and critical. So the first thing we want to look at is our revenue. What are we making here? So we'll look at revenue. And we're going to write that as a function. Now there are two components to our revenue that we'll look at. Let's look at f of x. And in our case, we're selling lots of popcorn. Maybe it's um, when we order, we, we send out these orders, it's bulk. So somehow we're able to only charge 15 cents per order. And when people buy your popcorn, you give them a slight discount if they buy a higher volume. So maybe it's 0 .000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000 five zeros after the decimal place, 2x. X is the number of orders that they're, they're actually placing, and maybe you're going to limit them. 
you could say, all right, we'll give you this discount up to 10,000 orders. So we'll have to say that our domain is X is less than or equal to 10,000. So just imagine we're selling a bunch of popcorn, it's kind of cheap, and it's 15 cents per package, maybe a little mini package of popcorn, who knows. Um, but that's the idea, that they get a discount over time. Now let's also assume that there's another function, g of x, and that function tells you how many orders you're getting. So your revenue function, r of x, what is that? Well, based on these two functions right here, it's just going to be f times g, right? f of x times g of x. In other words, the amount of money and revenue we're getting from each order times the total number of orders that we're getting, and that's our revenue function. And then you can see here that by keeping our functions in separate notation and then multiplying them later, we would be able to keep track in shifting prices and shifting orders and thus shifting revenue, right? That would help us keep track of all that different stuff. Whereas with cost, now with cost here, we want to have our total cost put together. So what are our costs of this company? Well, let's just assume you have to buy your ingredients, like any other company does, and you have to buy your packaging. So call it cost one and cost two. So here, the, co the first cost, let's say, per pa every time you sell a package, it really costs you uh, 40 cents for the ingredients, but then you get a small discount, 0 .0000000. 000 000 000 000 000 3 X right mm. So our total costs are based on, let's say, ingredients first, so cost one, and our second cost is on packaging. And we don't want our cost to go over the 15 cents that we're getting from our sales, so they should be smaller than that, right? So first of all, let's say for the ingredients, it's 0.04, it's 4 cents. And for the packaging, it's going to cost us, let's say, 5.5 cents. 5.5 cents. Now these companies will in turn give us discounts if we're ordering lots of ingredients. So we're going to get a tiny little discount there. There's six zeros after our decimal point times 3x. And this one's going to be 0 .000, same amount of zeros, and then we'll put uh, 5x. So this is, um, this is the cost, let's say, for ingredients. This is the cost for packaging. So our total cost is also based on the number of orders. So there are two function operations that are going to happen to find the total cost. So it's going to be the total cost as a function. It's going to be the sum of the two costs that we've listed here. So there's an example of function addition. Again, where we can keep track of those costs separately. But then again, it's still based on the number of orders, so we want to multiply that by g of x. And now we're keeping track of revenue, which we can keep in track of cost, so we can keep track of profit. So let's do that. So the profit function is going to change here. We're going to write as a function. P of x equals the total revenue, so R of x, minus the total cost. And I'm going to just actually simplify this here. I don't need a little t. I'm just going to say C of x. That'll be our total cost. It's a little bit cleaner. And we can actually glean a lot of information from this. Let's see what happens. The revenue is x times this function right here. So it's 0.15x minus it's a quadratic with a really small a value, 1, 2, 3. 4, 5, 2x squared. Then we're subtracting our total cost. So we want to add up these two things. So what would that be? So we're paying about 0.095 cents every time we make a sale. So that's a loss. And then this is uh, six zeros and then uh, a three. And then, oh, let's make this, I'm sorry. Let's make this a two. It's irrelevant, but I, I have it all worked out with these numbers. I'm going to keep that. So this is point of six zeros and a three, six zeros and a two. So it's going to give us point zero zero zero. That's three, six, five, x. Now those are our costs, and we're subtracting them. 
but that's multiplied by g of x, which is the number of orders. So I put an x here and an x squared there. Right? Now, when we put all of this together, we're using algebraic manipulation, 0.15x minus 0.123452x squared minus 0.095x plus 0.123456 5x squared. But so what, right? This is like, this seems really complicated. I guess you, you can see that we're, we're able to keep track of independent variables, and you can see the operations of functions coming to life, but how do we look at this on a graph to kind of make sense of it? Right, that's really, I think, the next step. So let's just look at our functions that, that we have written out so far. So we said that there's a uh, function f of x. This is our first revenue function, 0 0.15 minus 0.123452x. Then we had a function g of x, which is the number of orders. And then we had a function that was our total revenue function, r of x. And it was the product of f of x times g of x. OK. And then we have a function for cost. Now, the cost function I'm just going to plug in. That was the two costs added together, right? then multiply by the number of orders. And that was 0 0.095, so 9.5 cents per order. And then we had that nice little discount, 0 0.123456, 5x squared. And that was our cost function. Then our profit function is the difference, revenue minus cost. Wow, this graph tells me nothing, right? You're like, what is going on? I can't really see anything. So you, what we need to start doing then is zooming out. And I think you'll be surprised what we see here. So let's just zoom out a little bit. So drag these, drag those, let's zoom out here. And you know, the x, the number of orders, we limited at 10,000. So I, I want to go in the tens of thousands, okay? And then what about, ooh, that's interesting. Oh, that's right, they're quadratics. So they're going to go up and down. They might have looked like lines on a small scale there. But look at this. As I zoom, we get a really interesting picture here. OK, wow. What is happening? Well, let's hide our function for the first revenue and the second part of the revenue, the number of orders. We have our revenue function here, our cost function here, and what we're probably most interested in is profit. And look at the story this is telling you. There is an amount of orders that gives you the highest profit, and that would be the vertex of this parabola. And look at that number, 18,333.333. Well, that tells me that the maximum profit I could achieve here, uh, based on the certain discounts I'm giving, is not 10,000. Maybe my initial instinct was to limit it to 10,000, but it's much higher. So the idea is you put all of these functions together, and you might be able to start to answer complicated questions about a specific context. In this case, I chose profit. And this kind of illuminates the idea that, oh, maybe maybe we should give them a discount on the orders of popcorn at a higher volume because that will lead to more profit for us. And you can see that around 18,000 is a much better number to offer than just 10,000. And this company, of course, is made up and maybe you're not interested in money. But the important thing is to know that this does have an application. And I wanted you to understand that. Thanks.